I totally understand the skeptic because I'm the ultimate skeptic. I don't believe anything until it's been trialed and tested over and over and over and over again. But sometimes you just can't do that. Black and white's comfortable. It's this or that. Now there's a lot of gray. There's a lot of gray. As soon as I come down to my trail, look at my goosebumps going up again. As soon as I talk about it, man, it's just creepy as heck. It was winter, March 17th, 2009. What's really weird about it, my wife and I talk about it, I wasn't even gonna go out that day. I had went to bed early the night before because I went. I like to hike really, really early in the morning, right when the sun's coming up. So I ended up, she ended up almost pushing me out of bed. She's like, nah, go. You know you wanna go out and get some exercise or whatever. So she's like, get going. I started, I ended up falling back asleep at like, I think it was like 6, 6, 15 in the morning. I had gotten up at 4.30 and I just couldn't get myself out of bed. So she ended up, she's like, you know you want to get out. It's going to, not going to be a nice day. The weather report was really good that day. I think I ended up arriving at this park in eastern Ohio, which is about an hour and 15 minutes from my house. It was like 9 o'clock in the morning. I got to the trailhead. I just picked a random trail. And I parked my F-150 there uh, after I'd taken the drive out to the park. and. Uh, started hiking, put my backpack on, and started hiking down a trail. It was probably, I don't know, maybe five, 10 minutes before, not even that, before I got down to the end of the trail and I had stepped off the trail and took two steps into the wood line. And I got to a point where I was like, okay, I got the map of the trail and I'm like, you know, I had never been there before and I almost felt like I wanted to, I don't know if it was a sixth sense kind of feeling really, but I got to one point where I was like, you know, I knew there was a ravine that went down in where this, trail zigzagged and I wanted to, I didn't want to go all the way down to the end of the trail for some reason and I stepped off on in the trail to see if something, I could go through the wood line to check what was down in the ravine instead of taking the whole trail around. And I took two steps into the wood line, made two really loud crunching sounds and something down in the ravine, just you could hear something getting up off the ground and just ran like a freight train all the way down into the ravine. You could hear it running from left to right away and it was slightly moving away from me and startled me got back on the trail I, I ended up walking all the way down to the edge of this trail after I jumped back off of it and uh, got down to this point where it turned around the trail turns and starts to go at about a 45 degree angle down into the ravine and right at the point of the where the, this group of hemlocks were back behind me I probably heard I think it was three whistles like boom 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 right in a row as I got down to where I was going down in the ravine, and right at about nine, 10 seconds after that, I heard three other whistles just like it coming from way down in the ravine. <whistles> Didn't think anything of it. I just thought they were like bird sounds, but you know, it was like 41, 42 degrees that day, really nice weather, about 9.30 in the morning and I kind of blew it off, which I shouldn't have probably done because they didn't sound like bird sounds. There was no inflections in the tones at all. I kind of was curious. I mean, it really piqued my curiosity. I wanted to get down on the trail and find out what had made such a loud noise. Stupid me. <laughs> Thinking back on it, I'm like, that was a really, I could have been a bear, could have been anything else that would, would you know, you would expect it in the woods. I'm thinking to myself, Kind of being that curious and going down to that area, I probably should have just backed out of there and gone back to my truck and picked some other spot. You know, over the course of like the next five or 10 minutes, I went down to the ravine where I thought I had heard that noise, put my backpack on the edge of the ravine, and I'm looking around for some disturbance in the leaves. There's nothing on the ground. I know I heard something get up off the ground. I heard it moving, and it was fairly loud and fairly heavy sounding. There's got to be some disturbance on the leaves, you know, on somewhere around the trail, on the trail itself. And the, the trail itself was completely leaf, leaf covered. So it was wet leaves. Something should have, you know, if it took off really fast, should have left some kind of impressions. Looked on the hillside behind me. Like I said, I was there for maybe five, 10 minutes looking around. I found nothing. There was no disturbance, nothing. I mean, it was just nice pattern of leaves on the ground and the hill behind me. So I said, screw it, I was there for exercise. Ended up picking my backpack up, took my first step. I said, screw it, just I'm gonna go ahead and just keep on hiking. And I took my first step and that's when I caught my eye, all the leaves were down. I, you know, it was clear down at the one end of the top of the ridge up where I was pre previously. 
and I see this big white flash completely across the top of the ridge. And it caught my eye. I'm looking downhill with like a 45 degree angle. And you know, and the one thing people don't realize is your peripheral vision, your, your peripheral fields see movement really, really well. And I'm looking downhill, take my first step, and all of a sudden I see a white flash. And as soon as I bring my head up around, this large creature of some kind stops dead in its tracks right between these two trees. And we have a stare down for about 12 to 15 seconds. I'm completely startled. It filled up the whole spot between the two trees. Like I said, it, it was easily three and a half, four foot at the shoulder, but it was white from head to toe. And I told everybody that it looked he looked exactly like a sheepdog on the head. Face was all covered. It looked like what maybe were dreadlocks or matted hair coming down over its face. And older people my age will know, they've, we used to use old fashioned mops we used to, that were all white. They'd have strands on them like that long we cleaned floors with. You could have taken one of those white mops, stuck it on its head, and had those pieces of the mop fall down over the head. It's exactly what it looked like. It's exactly what it looked like. It looked like a sheepdog. And, you know, if you look at a sheepdog that's tending sheep, a lot of them have, I mean, everything's covering the face. The hair's coming down over. You don't see any facial detail at all other than the snout. On this thing, I couldn't see anything. Its face was completely covered, like, you know, like strands of rope coming down over top of its face. Same thing, it was draped down along over top of the shoulders, and you could tell it covered the entire head. It looked like a sheepdog. That's exactly what it looked like. I mean, it covered 100-plus feet in, like, no time. By the time I saw it come in my periphery and I'm looking downhill in the ravine, I see a white flash way off in the distance coming across the top of the ridge and I see it cover the whole top of the ridge. And when I actually go to that site, you can see that the distance where it came into my periphery, that's a, that's a good sized distance. And it's running in the, in the wood line, not on the trail. And once you see it's actually running in the wood line, dodging in and out of saplings and stuff, you know, and running on that, uneven surface, you're like, man, it covered a lot of ground. I could never come close to that running in the wood line. There's no way. I mean, it was hauling. So I don't, I, I can't imagine what speed it was running at, but you know, what was amazing too, if you think about it, all the leaves were real crunchy and loose on, in the wood line itself. I can't imagine running that speed and then stopping on a dime as soon as my head swings up, it stops on a dime. Like it wasn't even in motion. I mean, it stopped like in, in no time flat as soon as my, we connected eyes. It stopped right between those two trees. And I'm like, this is like, you can't even imagine something like that. And I'm like, you know, I, go, I look back on it now and I'm like, how did it possibly stop that quickly without falling that direction? The momentum's going to carry you at some point. How does it just stop like that? I couldn't do it even if I was running much slower than I'm able to do compared to what it's capable of. Like, I couldn't stop on a dime on that, the loose leaf litter. That would, that would cause you to slide a little bit. It, it just stopped. And it didn't make any sound. That's the amazing part. It made absolutely no sound in the, on those leaves. You know, and I was up on the ridge earlier before I came down and had a sighting with that thing. I was up on the ridge earlier. I took two steps into the wood line, and I'm making really loud crunching sounds on the leaves. I'm like, and I wasn't running. And you, you could hear it clearly because that's what startled it. It was down in, clearly it was the same creature. It was down in the ravine when I stepped off into the wood line. I startled it and that's what it got up off the ground or just took off and went downhill, it ran downhill. Clearly it's the same creature or what got startled. So I made tons of noise. It's running clear across the top of ridge on those crunchy leaves, not making a single sound. I, I don't even know how that's possible. First thing to enter my mind, as soon as I see this thing, Bigfoot, I'm, I, I thought about it immediately because my wife always, we always talked about it when we were camping. And I'm like, I never believed it until I actually saw something like that. And this thing was white from head to toe. I estimate probably about eight feet tall. That, that was the biggest thing. As soon as you got to the shoulders, that was more impressive than the, than the height. It was just wide. I couldn't believe how wide it was from shoulder to shoulder. And we had to stare down for about 12 to 15 seconds. And then I took off to go walking uphill and while I'm looking over my left shoulder and watching him as I'm going up the hill I get up to level ground he takes off and bolts the other direction and that's all I see of him from that point now I've got a 500 600 plus walk 
foot walk all the way back to, you know, this trail all the way back to my vehicle, and I'm looking over my left shoulder where I know he bolted. And uh, that was probably my longest walk I've ever, I've ever taken because I'm absolutely petrified. It's kind of hard to even talk about for the most part at this point because you're like, you can't imagine something that big and large being in the woods. And well, I never believed it. If it stays there, I gotta go up around back behind that thing. And to get back to my vehicle. This does not get me to my vehicle. This gets me farther down the ravine. And so what clearly happened was I actually, after I analyzed it a little bit later, months later, he ran down the hill. We just now changed spots. I stepped off up there and made a noise that startled him down here someplace. He took off down, the, down into the uh, ravine a little bit farther. He went into the wood line, went clear up the hill, and backtracked me down this trail and was planning on following me. That's the creepy thing that you did, just completely throws you off about this thing. So had I not seen the white flash, he moved at the wrong time. He should have waited for me to go down a little bit further. He shot across here and he covered that. I, man, it wasn't more than a second or two. He was hauling through the wood line. And what's really weird, from over there to when he... When my, when my eyes met him between these two trees, when he took a dead stop, I didn't hear him once going through that woodline. Made not a single sound. But yet running down this muddy trail, he made tons of sound. It sounded like an elephant running. I mean, it was that loud going downhill. Now tell me, what, how is that possible? And he's running on the crunchy leaves, the winter leaves that were, that I was making tons of noise on when I stepped off into the woodline. How's that possible? It, it just completely blows you away because you're like, okay, so, there, you know, that, I, I don't know, that distance there from here is probably at least, that's got to be a solid 80 to 100 feet. And then he took up that whole space. This is about the exact angle, about right where I was standing. And uh, he filled up almost that entire space between those two trees. I mean, so we had a stare down for about 12 to 15 seconds, and here's what I did. I watched him like this. I start moving uphill. He stayed right there the whole time. I came up through here and it looks, see how dense it gets right here? I made it to about right here. It was about right in here someplace and he was still standing there. He took off through the wood line. I mean, just shot. I saw the first three or four steps he, he was gone. I made it all the way up to the top of the hill. Didn't see, didn't hear any sounds, no wood knocks, no whistles, no nothing that I heard prior. And I didn't hear anything from down here. But clearly there was a second creature down here someplace. He was traveling in a, in a group of something, you know, at least one other individual. It just really, when you, when you go over it in your mind again, you're just like, you just, I can't believe I saw one of these things that I thought was a complete joke, you know, years prior. Once I got back to my truck, I stayed there and called three people. And I was basically, my wife would have been a perfect person to ask about this. She was one of the people I called, and I was completely hysterical on the phone, making no sense. My wife literally thought I, she thought my initial thought, because I was so startled and so shell-shocked, she's like, she literally thought maybe I killed something or killed somebody. That's exactly how startled she was. I hate to say something like that, but that's what really what she, she goes, she was on and off the phone with me, and I was on the phone with two other individuals. They were just trying to talk me down I tried to get out of there. I literally for four hours sat in my truck at the trailhead. I could not, I didn't have enough energy to depress the brake to actually turn the key on. My legs were shaking so bad. That's how bad it was. And you're just sitting there for four hours and four hours went by like that. It wasn't like you were just, you know, four hours normally, if you're aware of what's going on, you're like, that, that's kind of like an eternity just sitting in, the, in, in, you know, not driving your vehicle just sitting there staring at the woods. That's not the way it was for me. It went by really quick because I was on and off the phone with three other people. She came close to driving out with somebody else so she could drive the vehicle back. So that was the longest drive even to get all the way back home because it, I, you know, it, you're in complete astonishment. I mean, I don't even know how you describe that to somebody. And I had nothing but probably nightmares for about the next two to three months afterwards. And that is like the most terrifying thing. I don't, understand how people are not terrified or say they aren't when they see these creatures because it's not a it's not a pretty sight. I didn't get any bad feelings from the creature at all. 
whatever it was, I didn't get anything like it was going to jump on me, you know, attack me or do anything like that. That I didn't get. I know some people say they kind of feel that. I didn't get any bad feelings from it at all, like it was going to do anything. You look back at it now and I'm thinking, yeah, there's probably a good chance he was going to follow me down the ravine. The question is, what would have happened had I made it part way down the ravine? Maybe I would have crammed across the second creature that was clearly there. Then I'm thinking, yeah, no, I don't know if I could have made it back to my vehicle. Who would have thought? I just, I was planning on just taking a short walk on a trail. I wasn't expecting it to take probably more than an hour. You know, and I'm like, you sit there and go back and forth in your mind, you're like, I don't know what its intentions were. I didn't get anything bad intentions from the creature at all, but, you know, the aftermath for like two or three months afterwards, just, it never left your mind. I actually didn't even, I can guarantee you I went to work and I didn't, I was never into my work once. There was no concentration. We went three back three days later and my wife dragged me down in the woods to met because she was really curious as to where it was located that I saw the thing. She wanted to look at the area, look down at the ground for, you know, three days, you might still find some footprints, maybe someplace. I mean, the creature was running in the wood line, so the substrate's not really good, but she, I didn't want to go back. She's dragging me back because she was always interested in the subject, and I'm, she literally had to drag me in the woods. Took our two kids with us. They were off, uh, off school that week, and so we kind of made it like a day trip. And there is an obvious footprint with toe impressions and everything smack in the middle of the trail. You cannot miss this footprint. It was very obvious. And I'm like, I didn't want to think about it. I remember going back and thinking about it at the time. I'm like, I know darn well. The first thing I told my wife, I said, it's clearly still here. I said, look, I said, this thing looks fresh. Nice, decent impression in the mud. I mean, it wasn't, it was softer mud. It wasn't like really water or anything because it would have made a larger impression, clearly. And I'm like, there is no way I can go all the way back down there again. I said, there is no flipping way. And I said, you're going to have to pretty much talk to me the whole way down and keep me occupied because I can't, you know, and it, she eventually drug me all the way down. We got down there. Nothing else happened other than seeing that footprint on the way down. We're down there about 10, 15 minutes, measure the area. I said, I gotta get out of here. I can't stay here any longer because I'm starting to have panic attacks. I get to the point where probably a third of the way back, there's a pile of green scat right in the middle that you couldn't have missed that was not there on the way down. So that's what I said. You just, you kind of go over it in your mind. Four of us are walking down. One of us would have stepped in it, even if we wouldn't have seen it. There's no way we would have missed it. So something left a deposit on the trail the 15 minutes we were down there measuring the area. So it's clearly still here because I don't know any other four-legged animal. As soon as I saw the scat and it was just slimy green color, I'm like, you clearly didn't look like coyote didn't look like anything else and what just walks across the trail and spontaneously just leaves a deposit animals just don't in a 15 minute time frame I just we walked down the trail so anything four-legged we would have disturbed in that area they weren't they're not gonna hang around there because they pretty much scatter most of the time when people come through an area what else would have left a deposit like that it didn't look like bear scat I know what bear scat looks like it didn't look anything close to that so what else but as soon as I saw it, I'm like, I'm out of here. I just took off as, you know, I left them in the dust. And they had to catch up with me, but I, I made it all the way back to where that footprint was. And right there next to the footprint is like a stack of, I, I estimated it was probably 18 inches tall, but there were like six to seven foot branches blocking the trail, going from one end of the trail, right? I mean, within a couple feet of the footprint, one end of the trail, Clear, and they were like six to seven foot branches and they were talking all about 18. There were probably like nine or 10 branches there stacked about 18 inches high that were not there on the way down. And you're thinking to yourself, oh crap. It is clearly still here. And you keep trying to pretend like the footprint wasn't a footprint. In the back of your mind, you keep trying to pretend the scat really wasn't scat and maybe it was there on the way down. I, I bolted to my truck. 
they caught up with me. My wife, I said, we gotta get, I gotta get out of here. I said, that thing is clearly still here. I said, these things just spontaneously just appeared on the trail and they weren't there on the way down. I said, there's no way. And then there's no way for a human to access that trail except where we're parked. And we looked around, there's nobody around. We were there on, on a weekday. And that thing's clearly still here. I said, I gotta get out of here. And my wife's like, she goes, no, we're not going to any place. And she went and grabbed, we bought ap apples and bananas and some other food for my, my kids. And she's like, we're gonna have, have a little experiment. I'm gonna take the apple. And I, you know, I went back and forth with her about what the experiment she was gonna have and everything. And she's like, that scat down there, we're gonna take an apple. I'm gonna walk all the way down there and I'm gonna put that apple right next to that scat. And we're gonna come back in about 45 minutes to an hour and find out and see if anything moves, anything does anything. She walks right down in the wood line, come, shows back up about 10 minutes later, places it right on the leaf litter, right next to the pile of scat, that red apple, comes all the way back out. We sit there and wait for about 45 minutes to an hour. She's like, I'm gonna go back down, we're gonna take pictures and we're gonna see if anything happened. That apple got disturbed. She went all the way back down, disappeared out of sight from the trailhead. I'm watching the kids. She comes all the way back out and like a two, three foot diameter area was clearly scooped out of the, where the leaves were picked up, disturbed. The scat, the apple, and a huge scoop of leaves were picked up from the trail. They're gone. Scat was picked up, the apple's gone. There's not even any remnants of the apple. If it would have been a four-legged animal, they would have sat there and ate it. They don't take it, you know, carry off, carry it off any place. And what picks its own scat up? I can't imagine one animal that would have done something like that. I, I can't, I can't think of it. So I'm like, oh my gosh, it's out in the woods someplace just watching us up at the trailhead, basically just playing with us. But to me, scat is kind of the way, get out of my area, I don't want you here. And then when you block the trail, after we thought about it on the way home and everything, you know, putting those, it's clearly in its mind blocking the trail, I don't want you down here. That's what you're kind of going over in your head, you know, and you're thinking about it. And you're like, wow, it was standing here somewhere in the wood line because all the leaves were down. Somewhere back here in the wood line, it was watching us this whole time. And I'm like, that's just massively creepy to think about. There was like a big three foot diameter. You could see where something lifted a whole bunch of leaves, picked up the apple, picked up the crap, and everything that the leaves were underneath it for about three, three foot uh, in diameter by the yardstick. Picked it all up, there was a complete divot out of the mud. You could see where something walked off and took the whole entire, the entire area. Leaves were gone, scat was gone, apples gone. You know any four-legged animals that are able to come back here? And we only, we have the only way to get onto this trail. And we're parked at the trailhead. Now you tell me how that was, that happened. I met up with a woman that I mentioned to you before that she's a professor there locally and she ended up seeing clearly the same creature. She describes the creature exactly, and she lives like a mile and a half downstream from where I had my sighting. She's seen it more, more than 10 times, 10 or 12 times as I think it is daylight sighting she's had on her property. And she describes, she described the creature as a sheepdog. I don't know anybody else that I've heard a description as a sheepdog from a big, about a Bigfoot. And hers was white from head to toe. So clearly that creature, it was, it's nice because somebody else corroborates independently, somebody I don't know, they go and talk to one of your, one of your friends or don't, they don't realize they're telling their story and you're like, uh, you need to talk to somebody. You're like, uh, this would be a, it's a great way to back up what, what I saw. I don't need anybody to convince me, but it's nice when you get it independently corroborated from somebody else. Even with the Bigfoot thing, if you actually look at all the peripheral evidence, the cave paintings, the totem poles that Native Americans put in, you know, all their stories and stuff like that, and you just look at them objectively, if, even if you haven't seen a Bigfoot, you're like, yeah, there's probably good evidence for Bigfoot, even if you had never seen one. I just didn't want to look at it with an open mind. And I got a fairly large science background. I always thought I was objective. Guess what, I wasn't very objective, was I? because you can't have all these cultures in North America describe the exact same individual, have a completely different name for that individual, and you know darn well they never talk to each other. You know, one's living in New York State and the other one lived in the Pacific Northwest. Those tribes probably never talk to each other. 
The chance of that happening is almost, but you all describe the same creature? But, you know, if you look at it objectively, you'd be like, oh yeah, there's lots of compelling evidence, just peripheral evidence for like Bigfoot. And the same thing for UFOs. And you're like, there's tons of people dismiss it. I think it's becoming way more accepted, but I think UFOs for the most part for the general public is like way more believable than, than Bigfoot. So, but, you know, I don't have necessarily have a particular worldview or anything like that. I just, I just always thought I was a fairly objective I, I thought I did a pretty good job, and I, I didn't. I, I didn't do it with a lot of things until you see this, and then it completely opened your mind up. It was literally like a very surreal spiritual experience of some kind, and you're like, it completely opens your brain to completely all kinds of other possibilities. Because you didn't realize in your head, almost subconsciously, you were dismissing everything else. People, it could have been UFOs, Bigfoot related stuff, anything. You were just, I was dismissing a lot of stuff, if I have to be honest. And most people won't be honest with you. I'm like, nah, I wasn't looking at stuff objectively like I should. But that's where science really screws up and makes their, you get these people that are like, no, this is this, this is it, no. There's, there's very few things in life that are totally black and white. Like you're trying to, everybody wants it black and white because it makes you comfortable. That's not actually the case. A lot of times that's not true. Black and white's comfortable. It's this or that. Now there's a lot of gray. There's a lot of gray.